Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rukmini Kalimaki, uh, and I'm a reporter for The New York Times. Uh, I'm joining you here from The New York Times' uh, newsroom on the Foreign Desk, and I wanted uh, to discuss with you today uh, the arrest of, uh, of Ahmed Khan Rahami, uh, who is the suspect in the twin uh, bombings that we've seen in the last couple of days this weekend, including at two sites in uh, New York City's uh, Chelsea neighborhood and another two sites uh, in New Jersey. Uh, this young man, a 28-year-old immigrant from Afghanistan, uh, was arrested yesterday in the Linden, New Jersey uh, area. And on him, officials found a notebook. Uh, it actually had a bullet hole uh, in the notebook and it was stained with, with blood, indicating just how closely uh, he was holding it. And in that notebook, officials found concrete evidence of his radicalization. Among the phrases that he uses in the notebook is killing the kufar. Kufar is a religious term uh, that refers to unbelievers, so people that are not Muslim according to this very narrow uh, jihadi definition of who a Muslim is. And in addition to that phrase, um, uh, they found references to Anwar al-Laki. Awlaki is a towering figure in uh, the jihadosphere. He was a chief propagandist for Al-Qaeda, but he's also a figure that very much bridges Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, all of the ISIS fighters that I've spoken to and that I've studied um, uh, at some point passed through the lectures of Awlaki in their radicalization process. And uh, in addition to that, uh, there's references to the Fort Hood shooter. Uh, this shooting was uh, was carried out by a man that was that was radicalized in America by Al Qaeda uh, through through uh, the internet, etc., and who carried out that attack uh, in in an inspired uh, way, uh, and it's considered one of Al Qaeda's um, successes in inspiring a so-called lone wolf attacker. So I'm here uh, with you now, and I'd love to take your questions, and I'll be looking at the questions here on my on my notepad. So feel free to pitch in. Um, anything that you want to ask me, I'm uh, I'm I'm ready to uh, to answer your queries. Um, so for other um, you know folks um, who are looking to be radicalized, how would that be similar to the path uh, um, that Mr. Khan took? So at this point, there hasn't been a claim of responsibility for um, for the bombings that took place in New York City or in New Jersey. So we don't yet know. If this man is um, is is a follower of the Islamic State or of Al Qaeda or of neither, but uh, the 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 material that has been found in this notebook so far uh, is very common among really all of the cases of radicalization that I've looked at. Anwar Awlaki uh, is I, I've heard him described as the mood music uh, of the jihadist movement. He's so. Um, he, he's so omnipresent uh, in, in the Facebook posts, in the Twitter uh, posts of, of people who go down uh, this path. Uh, because he's, he was A, very eloquent, and B, charismatic, and he's also somebody um, who was an American citizen and lived in the U.S. before leaving his life here and, jo and joining uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula in Yemen. Um, the Fort Hood shooter uh, is a little bit more particular. I haven't seen him referenced uh, that that uh, frequently. Uh, but uh, for for people that are inspired by these so-called lone wolf attacks, the Fort Hood shooter, the Boston bombings, and then more recently Omar Mateen uh, in Florida and the San Bernardino uh, shooters uh, remain reference points. And as far as we know about what his family knew about this. Um, you know, what steps, if any, uh, have, did they take, have they taken, could they have taken to sort of intervene? What, what our team uh, that is reporting on the story uh, learned is that uh, this young man's father uh, apparently called uh, law enforcement officials roughly two years ago and, um, and tried to warn them that, that his son uh, was, was walking in this direction and, um, and that he was a potential terrorist. Now, this is the father's own um, account of this. Uh, we don't know to what extent he's being, he's being honest with us, uh, but he claims that he tried to, to warn law enforcement uh, ahead of time. 
We've seen this in a number of attacks. Um, Omar Mateen, uh, for example, was also in uh, the crosshairs of law enforcement. He'd been questioned by the FBI more than once uh, before that attack. But what is, what is particular about uh, Islamic extremism and the path to radicalization that these people take is that in the early uh, periods of radicalization, sometimes the only evidence uh, that law enforcement officials have is essentially a thought, uh, it, a, an idea. Uh, the idea that, um, that, uh, that non-Muslims are disbelievers. Uh, the idea that democracy uh, is somehow not in keeping with, with the plan uh, of God. Uh, and it's very difficult, um, given the laws in our country and given the, the freedoms that, that our country uh, provides, to, to lock somebody up just for something that they're saying or something that they're, that they're thinking if they haven't taken uh, actual steps uh, to plot an attack. And as far as uh, had, uh, was the FBI able to intervene, we don't know yet, um, you know, are there de-radicalization programs in place here uh, that you know, could have worked or what are, what are the abilities of governments to stop this sort of thing? You know, it's funny because in, in light of, of what a problem this is, it's, it's to me still surprising that in America there isn't a real um, de-radicalization program, at least not one that's available by, by civilians. Uh, the FBI has been working uh, on a de-radicalization program, but this is something that, uh, that, that has worked on uh, people that are already arrested and that are already uh, in jail. Um, uh, the New York Times a couple of months ago covered the case of, of a father uh, in California uh, who became concerned about his, his young son uh, who was beginning to show signs of radicalization and, and possible affinity uh, for the Islamic State. And he himself contacted the FBI. He went so far as to come to Washington uh, and attended a panel uh, on, um, on extremism and radicalization and went up to the academics at the end of this conference saying, please help me, I don't know what to do. Uh, and the end result is uh, his child was arrested. Uh, he's been placed in solitary confinement um, in a penitentiary uh, uh, so, uh, on the West Coast. And from the family's perspective, um, that's a pretty dire outcome. You know, they, they very much regret having gone to law enforcement because if, if your child ends up just being locked away, uh, that's not necessarily a positive outcome. Uh, in contrast to that, um, other countries uh, specifically Germany, um, uh, have created uh, programs that, that are, uh, I would say, more promising. Uh, there's a woman in Germany um, who um, has an expertise uh, in uh, the Middle East, and specifically, um, she, she's an Arabic uh, speaker, and she has, of her own accord, uh, begun working with the families of, of ISIS members, and she has created essentially a protocol um, uh, where she teaches family members how to speak to their sons and daughters once they've reached Syria, how to speak to them in a non-judgmental way, and how to keep the channel of communication open, because even when these people join the Islamic State, they often maintain contact with the people that are dearest to them. Uh, their mothers, um, sometimes siblings, uh, sometimes close friends. And what tends to happen is that once they get to the Islamic State and they're in Raqqa or, or whatnot, their, their family is of course um, outraged and angry. And instead, and, and they voice this when they're speaking uh, to their children, and, and as a result the, communica the, the communication breaks down. And this German uh, woman, her, her, the basis of her um, approach is that if, if she teaches the family members to speak in a non-judgmental way and just keep the calls coming. Later on, um, there's things that can be said and done to try to help pull, pull the, the son or daughter uh, out of that situation. And she has successfully pulled people out of Syria, which is quite a feat. It's very, very hard uh, for people, once they join the Islamic State, if they decide to leave, it's very hard to get them out because they're seen as defectors, as possible spies, and they become enemies of the Islamic State. Um, and, uh, and the penalty for being, for being called any one of those things is up to execution. So it's a very dangerous um, uh, prospect, and yet she successfully pulled people out. We don't yet have anything of the like in America. Uh, and that seems to be a hole that I think needs to be filled in light of, of what we saw happen this weekend, both in New York and New Jersey, but also in Minnesota, where ISIS uh, just claimed an inspired attack by a young man who um, stabbed nine people at a mall in St. Cloud.
Okay, so we have some questions from our um, yeah. viewers. Right. Let's see. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, Jack Allen Freed uh, is asking, shouldn't de-radicalization come from within the Muslim, the Muslim community? That's a very good point. Um, I, I feel that some of the most uh, credible voices in the de-radicalization process are actually former extremists. So these are people that became uh, members of Al-Qaeda, uh, members of ISIS uh, themselves, or earlier people who tried to join the Taliban, etc., and who were able, through whatever means, to pull themselves out. Um, one case of that uh, is Jesse Morton. Uh, he was um, he, he ran a website called Revolution Muslim uh, for several years in the mid in the mid two thousands, and that website became a honeypot for uh, for people um, interested in joining Al Qaeda as well as several of Al Qaeda's franchises like Shabab and Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and numerous plots, um, most of them foiled, uh, both in the United States and in the United Kingdom, ended up being linked to Jesse Morton's uh, website. Jesse was arrested, I believe, in 2011, uh, and um, for, um, for lack of a better phrase, he basically had just a come to Jesus moment in, um, in jail where, uh, where he, he began to question the ideology and he realized uh, that he had gone awry. And he made a full transformation. The FBI um, believes uh, that, that um, he's sincere in, uh, in his recanting. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, he was hired at George Washington University's program on extremism, where he is now going to essentially be an analyst studying the very ideology that he used to propagate. So obviously that's, that's a somewhat controversial uh, program. Um, parents at George Washington University, I think, were, were up in arms about the idea of a former Al-Qaeda recruiter uh, being not just on campus, but a member of the faculty. Uh, but um, I think that somebody like him uh, is, is so well-versed in this ideology that he can help us understand both how people fall into this, um, into this mind trap and how people can be pulled out. Uh, he's the very first case of an American citizen to be hired in, the, in this kind of public role in America. In Canada, they already have somebody called Mubin Sheikh. Uh, he was radicalized years ago, uh, went to join the Taliban, pulled himself out. And in England, there's an entire think tank made up of these former extremists. Um, so all of these people, to answer um, your question, all of these people are either uh, actual Muslims or were converts to Islam and remain Muslims. And they are speaking from inside the faith, which I, which I think is, of course, probably the most, the most um, authentic way that one can, one can speak about this problem. Let's see. Uh, Craig is asking, why do you believe that these people are targeting terrorism in America? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean, why is it that they're targeting America? So both Al-Qaeda and, and the Islamic State have made clear uh, that, th that the head of the snake, so the greatest enemy for them, is the United States. They believe that the United States is at war with Islam uh, in various theaters, including in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, uh, in Nigeria. And so their premier target is the United States. Interestingly, since the rise of ISIS, um, uh, Europe has come under much more strain and has had much more frequent attacks than the US. So the, the, the attacks that we've seen uh, in the US have been much smaller and much more infrequent uh, than in Europe. And um, analysts believe that this is simply a question of resources. It's much easier for uh, foreign fighters who went to Syria to reach Europe than it is for them to reach America. Uh, ben uh, Watanabe has a great question. How does the U.S., or the NYT for that matter, verify a claim that a group like ISIS is behind someone stabbing people at the mall? Wouldn't it be convenient and beneficial for ISIS uh, to claim it, even if it wasn't responsible? So this gets to a really interesting point. Um, there's, there's a widespread um, misunderstanding of both ISIS and Al-Qaeda out there. Uh, uh, people Still, still think that ISIS and Al-Qaeda claim anything and everything, and that they do so in an opportunistic fashion. In fact, if you look at ISIS's claims in the West, um, in general, they have been pretty accurate. So the claims, of, the claims of responsibility that have been issued have been of either attacks that they themselves perpetrated, we're talking about November 13th uh, in Paris, or the Belgium uh, suicide bombings, 
or else of people that they inspired through their ideology um, and who, who acted in their name. Okay? And um, what's important to note is that ISIS and Al-Qaeda have a following. They have a competing following. And just like my own reputation would take a hit if I put out incorrect information, so too their reputation takes a hit if they claim an attack that the other group did or if they claim an attack that has no link uh, to them whatsoever. That's not to say that there haven't been false claims. Both ISIS and Al-Qaeda have made false claims, but it's not, it's not um, the general rule. Now, for ISIS, the way that they claim attacks has been codified in, I would say, in the past year. They have um, a, a so-called news agency called Amok. Uh, Amok is um, available on Telegram, uh, and Telegram is an encrypted app on people's phone. And most followers of the Islamic State are on these channels, and so as soon as they, um, as soon as Amok claims an attack, you know that ISIS is essentially claiming that attack. How do I, at the New York Times, know that that claim is authentic? Well, I know which channels are the authentic Amok channels because I've been following them for a while. So I know, I, I, I'm watching them every day, and after every single attack, um, I'm, I'm sitting there every day just scrolling through uh, the statements and watching for that claim of responsibility. Um, for, for things like stabbings, etc., with ISIS, we're seeing that they're claiming them within a day or two, usually within a day. That was the case for Minnesota. Um, Al-Qaeda has a more complex and somewhat more confused uh, structure for claiming attacks. Uh, they claim their attacks by, by franchise. So for instance, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb has their own channels, and this is the group that is based in uh, West and Northern Africa. So I know that when there's an attack in that region of the world, I know the channels to go to. It's not so clear where to go to, uh, to see the claim of responsibility when the attack happens in the West because there have been so few uh, recent Al-Qaeda attacks in the West. A second difference is that Al-Qaeda uh, varies widely in how quickly they claim attacks. So for instance, for their franchise in West Africa, they tend to claim the attack within a day or two. Same with Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, but um, when the July 2005 uh, London bombings uh, took place, it took almost a year for Al-Qaeda to claim that attack, right? Um, and so with Al-Qaeda, it's more difficult uh, to pin down the claim of responsibility than I would say for ISIS, at least, at least these days. Kaleem Sheikh um, is asking whether the path to radicalization begins from illegal sanctions and illegal wars, and where else? Uh, Kaleem, there's, there's certainly people that, um, that have found themselves on the path to radicalization following the US intervention in Iraq, uh, which was viewed as, uh, as unjust by most of the Muslim world. But um, that doesn't uh, explain the path to radicalization of people uh, like a young woman that I, that I profiled in Washington state. Uh, who knows very little about uh, the U.S. rule in Iraq and who happened to be a Christian, and not just any Christian, she was a Sunday school teacher. Her path to radicalization had nothing to do uh, with, uh, with America's intervention in those theaters and had everything to do with what the ideology was promising her and the, the kind of um, action figure role that she was going to play uh, if she joined the Islamic State um, as a mother of the, of the caliphate. So I think um, we need to get our heads around the fact that uh, the motivations are diverse uh, and people come at this from completely different uh, arenas. Let's see. So I'm looking for some more questions from you guys. Um, if well, you, actually, we have yeah. a very interesting one from yeah. uh, Rekha Rocha, uh, who wants to know, you know, what do we in the West mean by radicalization exactly? You know, uh, what do other the other parts of the world mean by radicalization? Um, is that sufficient to describe what the issue is here? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and it's it's a complex one. Um, what I mean by radicalization is uh, people that have adopted uh, this extreme form of Islam. Uh, a, a, I would say a weaponized form of this ideology that essentially believes that um, that the only lawgiver uh, is Allah 
And once you accept uh, that principle, that means that man-made structures, such as a democratic government, such as um, an elected government in the U.S., are, are no longer legal and are entities that need to be rebelled uh, against. Uh, a second concept that, that uh, people on this path accept uh, is that, um, that there's a war between believers and disbelievers. Uh, and that uh, that disbelievers um, are basically legitimate targets uh, for violence up to death. Uh, in this ideology, there are no civilians. Killing children, killing women, uh, killing adults, killing old people, all of that is legal because they are infidels, they are disbelievers. Um, there's a number of concepts that, um, that people going down this path adopt. Um, and what's important to note is that even once these concepts are adopted uh, by the young man or woman, uh, there's an extra step that takes them from that place to then acting out on the violence. So there, there's, there's an entire pool of people that believe in these ideas and that never move on to violence. So it becomes, it becomes um, quite complicated uh, to, to sort out. Um, and so I'll throw out one more question and maybe we can wrap after sure. this. Uh, Kelly Louise uh, Delaney um, asks, you know, what do you think about the access the public is given in the U.S. to the families of terrorists? And I guess that would include the government as well in terms of interacting with information that they're able to get from the families themselves about, you know, their loved ones. That's obviously a, a, you know, a, difficult, um, a difficult point, but the families of these terrorists are, of course, um, the, the, the closest point of contact that we have with them. So the father of the suspect that was arrested yesterday, the information that he's bringing to bear, namely that his son was showing signs of radicalization as early as two years ago, uh, and that he himself considered him a terrorist as of two years ago, that's, that's, that, that's not something that, that is insignificant uh, to this investigation. Um, but very quickly from there, uh, there is an issue of privacy, um, and um, and I've you know I've I've been in the unfortunate situation after um, after recent terrorist attacks, uh, especially in Europe, of having to go and and knock on the doors of family members who are who oftentimes um, are left in the dark, uh, and, um, uh, and 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 are not aware of what their their child, their son or daughter is planning, and so they they of course feel victimized by both the media attention and the attention from officials, but. In, in the immediate hours after an attack, all of us are asking the question, why? Why would somebody do this? How did they get here? Uh, and, and in trying to answer that, uh, an obvious place to go is the people that were closest to him or her. So I think we'll wrap it up now. Thank you so much to all of you uh, who stuck with us, and I'm sorry for the technical issues that we had earlier. Thanks again.